Welcome to the Great Food, Great Stories podcast on Portland Culinary Radio. I'm Stephen Schaumer, your host, and I am just, just delighted. I am really delighted to have Jason Myers with me. Um, he is a culinary heartbreaker. At least he's broken my heart twice now. Uh, but just, we'll get to the, we'll skip right to the end, Jason. First of all, good morning. Delighted you're here. Good morning. Thank you. So uh, your current restaurant project is Basilisk. Did I get that right? You did. And so you make one of the best uh, fried chicken sandwiches that exist in Portland. Um, my friend Martin Sismars with the Lamb Week, he like cheerleads, I think, you know, the, the leads the chorus for your amazing chicken sandwich, which I've had. And it is phenomenal. Um, but you've had a really cool culinary journey. I've been following you so, uh, since 2012. Uh-huh. Uh, happily, mostly happily. We'll get into that. <laughs> and I just wanted people to get to hear your story. Um, and, and again, your chicken sandwich. If, you, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't been to Basilisk, hit pause, go down, get the fried chicken sandwich, and then come back. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. So where were you born? Uh, I was born in Corvallis, Oregon. And high school? Uh, West Albany High School. All right. When did you come to Portland? Um, about six years ago. So 2010. That's about right. Yeah. Okay. So what brought you to Portland? Um, I had just returned from, I finished culinary school in New York and um, my girlfriend had moved to Portland while I was in New York. And so I moved back uh, to Portland to be with her. Was she down in Albany? Uh, she was in Corvallis. Corvallis. So you guys were in Corvallis. Mm-hmm. You run away to go to New York to culinary school. Uh-huh. She comes to Portland, and then you followed a girl to Portland. I did. That is fantastic. Yeah. All right. So what the heck took you to culinary school? Why culinary school? Uh, I was. I've been cooking on and off, um, just for fun most of my life, and uh, had ended up working uh, not in food at all, but working in IT, and uh, ended up really not liking that career path at all. Why, did, why didn't you like IT? Uh, I just couldn't stand. I just needed to produce something. I couldn't stand sitting in front of a computer screen all day long. It just slowly drove me crazy. So. And were you in an office with a beautiful view overlooking the city? Uh, I was in the opposite of that, and I had no uh, windows and nobody else in the office. And I was just in a concrete cube. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> and it slowly drove you crazy, huh? Yeah, yeah. So IT, so is that um, what your degree is in? Uh, no, I majored in communications at Oregon State. So you went from communications to IT to culinary school? Yep. <laughs> okay, so I get why you left IT, because uh-huh. uh, it sounds like it was just um, ca- causing you to go mad, uh-huh. uh, and not your cup of tea. Right. Uh, IT was not his cup of tea. <laughs> but why choose culinary school? Because you, if you want to change careers, there's a lot of things you could do, particularly with your communications degree. Right. Uh, I was. I spent most of my time in IT uh, in my little concrete cube, um, not doing a lot of work. So uh, I would spend a lot of my time looking up recipes and then I would figure out what I wanted to make that night for dinner. So then I'd leave and go to Fred Meyer and pick up groceries and go home and spend the rest of the night cooking. And it didn't feel like work no matter how many hours I spent in the kitchen. So Okay. So a tangent. Um, a lot of people love to cook. Uh-huh. I love to cook. Uh, not the greatest cook in the world. Average. Good. I can make you a good breakfast. Mm-hmm. I would never want to cook professionally. I just think, for me, it would drive me crazy. And I think a lot of people think if I love to cook, then I can I can succeed in a restaurant. Uh huh. Have you seen that? Yes. And it's not true, is it? No. <laughs> but you love to cook, and you love to cook professionally. Uh huh. It worked out well. That's awesome. Yeah. So how old were you started cooking? Um, probably about five. Cooking with my mom in her kitchen, baking cookies. So you've been cooking a long time. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So yeah. and so now you're a professional. Professional, you have your professional chef uh-huh. and you're self-employed and you're a business owner. Uh-huh. Fulfilled? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy. That's awesome. Yeah. So obviously communications probably wasn't your deal. No. And then you went from that to IT, which wasn't your deal. Uh-huh. And now you're on your third career. Yep. And you're fulfilled. Yeah. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah, figured, okay. figured it out. <laughs> so, uh, so I understand now why you left IT. I get why you chose culinary school. But why New York? Uh, I wanted to, I think the, New York is one of the greatest culinary cities in the world. And uh, I had grown up in Oregon and lived here most of my life and wanted a little bit different experience. Uh, I had a friend from high school that I've, actually from grade school, I've known him since kindergarten, uh, that lived in New York and offered his couch up for me to sleep on. So I was able to save some money and uh, just went for it. And did you like culinary school? Uh, I did. It was, uh, it was pretty intense. Um, a lot of interesting characters, but so how much of what you learned in culinary school serves you? Like, so I took geometry in high school, and they told me I had to, and it helped me. And that's that's a lie. Geometry is awful. Um, but how much you learned in culinary school actually helps you in your journey today? Uh, for me, it was a lot. Um, just learning the fundamentals, and 
it just gave me a lot of resources to draw on and a, a better understanding of, I guess, the progression of, of, uh, of cuisine and food. Um, and then also just discipline, learning how to focus. And some culinary schools uh, do better than others. Some just teach you how to cook. Some teach you how to cook and business. Mm -hmm. So did you get business well at your school? Uh, we didn't. It was pretty much just cooking from day one. Okay. So yeah. how the heck did you learn how to make a business work? Uh, trial and error. A lot of crying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just trying to, you know, take it slow, start, start small and manageable. And then um, once I felt like I was managing the small bit well, add a little bit more and just grow very slowly. That, that's amazing. Uh, a lot, a lot of business restaurants have failed here in Portland, and you've succeeded like three times over. Uh -huh. uh, that, that's just, you know, that's just not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the one of the culinary schools I love here in Portland is uh, OCI, Oregon Culinary Institute. Read about them in my first book, mm -hmm. and partially because they teach you how to cook and they teach you business stuff. Yeah. And they give little exercises like they have you um, buy the fruit and weigh the fruit and then cut it all up and now you got much less fruit and then figure out how much you need to sell it to make a profit. Right. Um, and you didn't get that in your culinaries. Uh, that was, food costing was all we got. That's um, it. That's pretty much it. And there's a little bit more to succeeding in a restaurant than food costing, right? It's an important part, but yeah, there's, there's a few <laughs> other things. Yeah, people think if I just like to cook and if I can cook great food, I'll make it. I see that with food cart owners a lot. Yeah. And uh, those, those people sometimes fail, sadly. Yeah. All right, so let's get to where the journey you began breaking my heart. All right. Um, so oh, well, but before we get to that, before we get to the, your, your meanness and awfulness. <laughs> so you arrive in Portland in 2010, mm -hmm. when you opened your first cart, um, Sideshow, July 2012. What'd you do in that gap? Uh, I worked for uh, Clyde Common. That was my first cooking job here in Portland and worked for them uh, for a little while and then went to the breakfast room at the Ace Hotel. Excellent. And then what, what made you decide to take the leap to actually open a food cart? I'd always wanted to work for myself and give that a shot. Um, and I would always browse Craigslist for carts and trucks and things for sale that might work out and found a truck and got my name on the list to, to get a, a spot at Ninth and Alder. And We'd go down to Corvallis on weekends and work on the truck and come back and cook breakfast for hotel guests and did that for three to four months and the spot opened up and took it. That's awesome. So two, two desires came together for you. One, uh, being a cook professionally, chef. Uh -huh. The second one is uh, being self-employed. Uh -huh. And food carts are a way that you could make that happen. Oh, yeah. Okay, so sideshow, uh, man, just such amazing food. Thanks. Um, so you started out really wisely with a small menu. What was on your first, me the first menu at sideshow? Uh, the first menu was uh, fries and poutine and beignets. And they were good beignets. And it's really hard to get good beignets in Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were really good beignets. Thank you. Um, and so a lot, some food carts they see start with a huge menu, and that's, that, that's a recipe to failure. you got to start with a small menu. But you almost started too small a menu. Right. Uh, it was pretty clear early on that we needed something a little bit more substantial than just fried potatoes and fried dough. <laughs> and so what did you add? Uh, we added sandwiches um, in the fall, shortly after I opened, and then... Uh, the following spring, we started doing uh, burgers. And you did a duck fat burger. We did. It was awesome. And then you did, on Fridays, yeah. F-R-Y-D-A-Y, Fridays, uh -huh. you did duck fat fries. We did. And then eventually you quit. Yes. And that's when you <laughs> broke my heart for the first time. The first time you broke uh -huh. my heart. <clears throat> it's one of the best burgers I've ever had, and they probably are the best fries I've ever had. Oh, thanks. Would you ever consider doing, like, a, an evening one time selling tickets like that I could promote of revisiting that classic and doing a dinner of duck fat burgers and duck fat fries. That sounds, sounds pretty great. I would promote it. I you, have no problem with that. You could idea. sell tickets. I think it'd be yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. And we could get, you've got the, um, pay dirt bar. People yeah. could have really good beer with their burger. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, there's no negatives to that at all. I love yeah. it. All right. So you, you have a food cart that, that from the outside is rocking and rolling. It's doing good. You're getting good press. You've got idiots like me showing up to writing about it and <laughs> Facebooking about it and tweeting about it. And yet you shut the thing down uh -huh. and then open in the same space, Rua, and you, you gave me culinary whiplash. You went from <laughs> burgers, in my head, I know you did other things, uh -huh. and beignets. Oh, I love those beignets. Did I tell you the beignets were amazing? I think, yeah. I think it, so. People thought I was on cocaine because I just stick my head down in there and I'm just covered with, you know, the dust. The yeah. dust, yes. Uh -huh. uh, and then you take a, a hard right turn and you start, or maybe a hard left turn, I don't know which way, and you start doing Vietnamese food. Uh -huh. So why, why did you do such a, such a change? Uh, the sideshow was great for um, summer 
tourist season. Uh, we did really well then, but then as soon as the the tourists left and the weather changed, we uh, didn't really have any or much appeal to the uh, the locals. And I wanted to kind of serve them a little bit better. So, so. in Ninth and Alder, there's not a lot of people that live in that community, mm -hmm. but there's people that work there. So right. they're coming out of their offices, they're headed out for lunch, and they're not going to eat a big burger every day for lunch. Right. Maybe once a month to be a treat. Yeah. So you needed a, a menu that was more appealing to them. Mm -hmm. So why choose Vietnamese food? I've always been a big fan of Vietnamese food. Um, so uh, one of my go-to cuisines at home when I would when I would cook, I'd always play around with it. So uh, went to Vietnam for a little while. Um, in between closing the carts and and uh, studied over there for a bit, and then opened up a room. And you made amazing banh mi sandwiches. Thank you. You did a really good uh, Vietnamese style chicken, mm -hmm. uh, fried chicken. Yeah, that was really good. Not not as it was great. Not as good as the, not as not as amazing as those burgers and fries. Right. At least right. for my for my appetite. <laughs> uh, but really really good. And then you broke my heart for the second time. Uh huh. Well, not yet because you moved Rua. Right. So you moved from um, Ninth and Alder over to the Zipper, which is a collection of micro restaurants. Mm -hmm. Why did you make that move? Uh, it was, I think, just time to do it, uh, and the space was available. My sous chef and I have we've been working together for a while, and, and uh, we were always talking about doing a restaurant. And we had been to the Ocean Space on Twenty Fourth and Gleason, and really liked that kind of style. And found out that the developer was doing Twenty um, Fourth and Meatballs was over there. Yes, I love yeah. them. That's yeah. really good meatballs. They're great. Uh, like that size of restaurant, that kind of idea of having a few places um, close together, kind of a step, the next step from a food cart. Um, and the developer was doing another space, and and uh, Luke my Sue found out about it, and and told me and went and checked out the space and got the ball rolling. That's awesome. So you made the leap to brick and mortar. Uh -huh. Okay, and then Rua is rolling along just fine. Yeah. Everything's doing good. Uh -huh. And um, then you shut Rua down. Yes. <laughs> and you broke my heart again. Uh -huh. And so then you, uh, when did you close Rua? Uh, February of this year. And then you opened up in March, right? Uh -huh. uh, as uh, Basilisk. Basilisk, yes. Basilisk, man, yes. I just get that wrong. Okay, so what? Where the heck does that name come from? What does it mean? Uh, basilisk is a legendary chicken monster, and we make legendary chicken sandwiches. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. All right, so it's not a Harry Potter reference. No, it's not. All right, nothing against Harry Potter though. No, Harry Potter's great. All right, because I mean, if you don't like Harry Potter, my my uh, friend Marisa will get after you. No, we're I I don't want to upset anyone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, it's cool, your logo, that big chicken. It's yeah. just, it's really awesome. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, so legend, so it's a legendary chicken monster and you make legendary chicken. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I like it. All right, so why the heck did you go from Vietnamese food to these fried chicken sandwiches? That's, that's again, that's another, you've, you that's another big switch. Yeah. Uh, fried chicken had always been kind of a hobby dish um, for me. I just love fried chicken. And uh, so I've been working on it kind of for my own personal reasons for years and or personal enjoyment. Um, and Rua was great in that space, but it, I mean, doing well, but it wasn't, I think, uh, this wasn't sustainable there. Uh, the amount of prep in Vietnamese food is kind of insane. So a lot of labor costs. A lot of labor. Um, a lot of work. A lot of work. I was there all the time, um, which is the way it's supposed to be when you start a restaurant, but uh, there was no hope of me ever leaving. So we decided, well, I mean, this is gonna kill us. So I talked to Luke and uh, said, well, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna do this and stay in this space, let's shut Rua down and, and do something that we're super passionate about. And if that works, great. If it doesn't, then we tried and so far it's going great. But if it hadn't if it hadn't worked, you would have tried another thing, wouldn't you? Uh, no, I think that would have been it. I think that would have wiped <laughs> me out. Because a lot, of, so you you've done a lot of pivoting, uh -huh. uh, both um, professionally, to find where you want to be, and then once you found your niche, self-employed chef, because you can be a chef and not be self-employed. Some people that's yeah. their niche, mm -hmm. but self-employed chef. Then you did um, two different pivots away from what you were to get to where you are. Uh -huh. That's a lot of that's a lot of change. Yeah, it's a lot of courage. Yeah, a lot of people don't have the guts to do that. Um, there's a fine line between uh, courage and insanity, I think. So, <laughs> and I think as long as you're over closer to the insane line, then I think you might succeed as a small as an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so now you probably have one of the best chicken sandwiches that I've ever had. Thanks. Um, now tell me again how to say it. Basilisk. 
Basilisk. Uh-huh. I, I don't care. I just want to eat it. Nailed it. Yeah, I love it. Basilisk. Okay, so talk to us about the menu at Basilisk. What do you? So now it's uh, what do you got? Uh, the fried chicken sandwich, of course. That's our baby. Um, that's not a baby. That's like a huge monster. Well, yeah, it's a big baby. <laughs> it, well, yeah. uh, I'll put pictures up uh, with if if you're listening to this podcast, just go to the article accompanying it, and uh, you will see pictures of the sandwich. Um, we do the fries that we used to do at Sideshow. Uh, they're not duck fat, but that's the same technique. So they're nice and crispy and double fried and awesome. Um, we do uh, Dan Dan fries. So it's like Dan Dan noodles, except with French fries instead of the noodles. That's got peanut sauce and cilantro and kosher baby dill pickles and chili oil and all this great stuff on it. Yeah, that um, and a beer is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a, a tofu sandwich that we fry in the same uh, style that we do our chicken sandwich in for the vegetarians. And uh, a couple of green salads with, with poached chicken or our awesome fried chicken on it. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And you, have, uh, you do something crazy with soft serve. Oh, we do. We have the uh, Kool-Aid flavored soft serve. So where I didn't even know they still made Kool-Aid. They do. It's not as easy to get. Yeah, because it, it used to be. to be like big displays, you know, in right. the market. That's and what I, I remember. I noticed yeah. the other day, like, I don't see the big Kool-Aid displays. And I could never make it anyways, guys. I could never get all the water in the envelope ever. So. Yeah, yeah. We walked, <laughs> we walked down to, uh, when we first had this idea to do the Kool-Aid soft serve, down to the Fred Meyer um, on 28th by the restaurant. And they had, I think, two flavors of, of Kool-Aid packets. And as a child, I just remember this wall of Kool-Aid flavors. And I guess they don't do that anymore. So, but, but you're able to find different flavors? Yeah, Amazon is, is a great resource for finding Kool-Aid okay. flavors. Yeah. All right. And so what, where the heck did you get the idea to make Kool-Aid soft serve ice cream? Uh, we were trying to find, we had a, I had a soft serve machine from the sideshow days and we weren't using it um, for anything. And this was when we were still Rua. And uh, we had done a bunch of different flavors of soft serve and played around with things, but you had to be careful with what you added to any base because it would screw up the chemistry of the soft serve. It was very delicate. And uh, like, well, what can we add that has nothing but a flavor and color? And it's Kool-Aid. That's perfect. Yeah. And then we figured that with the, with the fried chicken sandwich would be killer and basilisk was kind of born out of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Soft serve is kind of a thing. I know we've, a cheese and crack used to be a food cart. Mm-hmm. Um, they do a great job. He does soft serve. He puts ganache in the bottom of oh, his wow. and a little cocoa powder. That sounds awesome. Um, burger Stevens, uh, yeah. Don Salamone. He's a rec- uh, chef. Uh, a lot of respected places. He has a burger cart and he does soft serve. Uh, makes his own base. And then uh, I was a pizza jerk just the other day and they know oh, nice. do soft serve. Nice. Uh, so that's, it's a cool thing. Yeah. It's soft serve. I like it. It's kind of old school. Yeah. Kind of fun. I remember when I was a kid, he used to go to Tasty Freeze. Oh, yeah. And get the soft serve. I don't yep. know if they had that where you were growing up. Uh, we had the Tasty Freeze knockoff called Hasty Freeze, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure had the exact same menu, but just changed a letter in the name. So yeah. <laughs> then they didn't have to pay licensing. But they had giant soft serve cones, so yeah, it's great. That's awesome. And uh, and uh, just congratulations on the success of your business, Thank and because you. you've had a successful business and you do amazing food, mm-hmm. uh, which is really good. So what do you th- what role has social media played in the success of your business? I'm, I'm big on branding and marketing yeah. and social media. Um, with I wasn't very good at it when I first started. I don't know if I'm good at it now. Um, I do more of it now. But with, with Sideshow and with Rue of the Cart, um, I, would, I would post things a little bit, but didn't do much. And then uh, Rue of the Restaurant, I tried a little bit harder with it um, to keep up on it. And with, with Basilisk, it's been, it's been a, an amazing uh, resource to have to just use Instagram and show people the food and show them what we're doing and kind of have fun with taking pictures of the food and and uh, engaging with um, customers. And yeah, it's been, it's been much better with Basilisk than, than any of the others. So you think that's played, at least contributed somewhat to your success? Absolutely, yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's, I have people tell me, I don't have time to do social media. And don't worry, in about six months when your business goes out of business, you'll have all the time in the world right. you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's next? Are you going to open a, a, a pie shop or something different? Gonna... Um, just, just nice and nice, a whole bunch of iced teas. <laughs> so okay, so two different questions. One, yeah. have you thought about like adding a second location? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I would love to do a, a second location that's a little bit bigger and um, and expand the menu. Uh, maybe bring back some duck fat burgers. Ooh, know, that would be good. Um, and you know, some like use something like that as the commissary, and then and then keep the space at the zipper too. So that'd be good. Maybe yeah. do like a chicken fried steak burger. Yeah, chicken fried steak, but duck chicken. fat fried steak, duck fat burger. 
chicken fried duck fat steak burger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, and have you thought about adding anything to the menu currently where you're at? Uh, yeah, the latest thing that we're working on um, that's definitely going to be going on the menu, hopefully by the end of the month, is um, some nice liege-style waffles. Uh, uh-huh. And we're going to do chicken and waffles. Okay, in liege style. Yeah. So you're going to have the, you know, where you make a dough. Uh-huh. Are you going to do brioche dough that you rise? Yeah. So it's not a batter that you pour. Right. These are like like uh, gaufre gourmet or gaufre gourmet, depending yes. on you ask, used to do. Yeah. And then now they're at a Gigi's Cafe. Mm-hmm. I love them. They do yeah, a great job. Great. So you're going to do that kind. You're going to get the waffle iron that weighs 75 pounds, the whole deal? We've got it. It's just sitting there. Okay, so you told me chicken and waffles, but I didn't know you meant like the real <laughs> badass kind of chicken and yeah. waffle. So put your chicken mm-hmm. on a Liège-style waffle. Yep. Okay, put a little cayenne pepper in the waffle. That's my suggestion. Okay. Will I get maple syrup? Yeah. You're going to have maple syrup I will that? have maple syrup, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I yeah. just, I'm a bit distracted right now thinking about it. <laughs> I, that is going to be phenomenal. Yeah. We, this, the testing process is a little bit slow because every time we, we test it and eat a bunch of chicken and waffles, we have to immediately take a nap and recover for a little while. And then we can't just test and taste constantly. So yeah, it's a slow you, process, but I, we'll get there. I like like a nice whiskey cocktail with my chicken and waffles. Yeah. Because yeah. the whiskey just cuts through the maple and it just it's phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Chicken and wa- Liège-style waffles mm-hmm. and chicken. Yep. That's not fair. That's just not fair. Okay, anything else you're thinking about in the future adding to the menu? Um, we definitely want to start doing some uh, some fried chicken sandwich specials and kind of playing with that a little bit. I mean, we love our, our standard sandwich, but... Just adding like different flavors or different mm-hmm. themes and... Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've, awesome. we've played around with a, uh, a coconut-crusted fried chicken that's been really good. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, with a little bit of a jerk mayo. And uh, another one is a, a kimchi fried chicken sandwich. So, we've got a few, few in the queue. Uh, okay, so you had me at the co- that coconut because I love yeah. uh, coconut is one of the flavors I love, but often things made with coconut or alcohol with coconut mm-hmm. is awful. Yeah, it's rare that it's really good. Yeah, and I'm convinced uh, your culinary background. You, you, if you made a co- what you coconut encrusted chicken sandwich? Yeah. with a uh, jerk mayo over a little shredded cabbage. Oh my gosh! Slice of pineapple. It's good. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that okay. was again one of my sous chef's ideas. That was his one of his. Uh, I want that sandwich. Yeah, that is phenomenal. Yeah. Come, come up with a cool name for that and uh, market that sucker. Give us like a, a three week advance notice before you put it on the menu. Okay. To, so like in three weeks, in two weeks, in one week, so we don't miss it. So we can show up and devour it. Okay. Sounds good. That that sounds yeah. amazing. Then you can do that as an occasional special. Yeah, we'd love to do get a nice uh, a nice selection of sandwiches and and just rotate them. Just do one special sandwich a week in addition to our. Our standard chicken sandwich, so. And specials keep chefs sane. Yes. Yeah. Because you make the same thing every day, and you kind of just get bored out of your mind. Mm-hmm. And then the special lets you be creative, and then you get to share it. When yeah. we, get, we get the benefit of that creativity. Yeah. Works out well for everyone. <laughs> I love it. All right, Jason. I am, uh, I think, is there anything we missed? I think that covers most of it. That's, that's good. That's my life. Yeah, I think it's incredible, your journey. You've gone from uh, communications to IT and being driven mad mm-hmm. uh, and not fulfilled to culinary school, working at a couple restaurants, self-employed, food cart A, food cart B, brick and mortar one, brick and mortar two, and now you're fulfilled, you're you're paying the bills. Yeah. And you're happy. Pretty happy. Yeah, no complaints. Uh, congratulations. A lot of people can't go from point A to point C because people think it's A to B. It's not. It's A to C because you go A, B, C. Yeah. And you've made that leap. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. It's been a, it's been a fun trip. All right. And then think about that, uh, that someday we'll do that special event where we'll have a uh, duck fat burgers and duck fat fries one night only we'll sell tickets we'll have a lot of fun sounds good let's do it all right well congratulations i wish you all the best continued success awesome thanks Stephen. cheers all right great food great stories on portland culinary radio i'm Stephen shalmi your host we've been visiting with jason myers founder of basil isk i got it right you got it all right cheers everybody mm-hmm.